Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. You guys be seated. Yeah. Praise the Lord. My goodness. Woo. That is so good and so true. He is a good, good father. No better father. Perfect father. God is our perfect heavenly father that loves us more than we love ourselves will provide for us better than we would ever provide for ourselves or our children. I, and that's saying something. You remember what Jesus said about that? He said, to, hey, if you guys, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and in comparison to the holiness of God, we are evil, right? If you guys, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children when they ask you, how much more will your heavenly Father Give good gifts to those who ask him and love him and obey his commandments. I mean, that's a good word from the Lord right there. And I'm just saying that God will provide more for us than we will provide for our own. And that's saying quite a bit. And he loves us that way and he has done it and he will do it. And he's told us to, uh, you have not because you ask not, you know. <laughs> ask anything in my name. I'll do it for you. And so anyway, the Father has made those great promises. We're looking at these five names. I mentioned to several of you that were in here. We've had a few more that have kind of trickled in over the little bit of time that we've been, that we've been in praise and worship. But uh, we're looking at, uh, been in a series called Unmasking the Enemy. And we're looking at five names or titles of our enemy. Uh, basically, I just chose the five that I think probably are the more prominent names that are used in the Bible. Over 38 names. Well, I'm up to 38 actually. I've got a list, and I'm up to 38 names. Every, as I read, and, and I come across a name or, or, a, um, or a representation of, of the enemy. Sometimes it's an adjective, and sometimes it's maybe a description of his nature or something. But, but 38 different things in the Scripture that our enemy is called and named. And, and it's our, uh, my supposition to you that what, his name, what he's named in the Word reflects his character. And it helps us to understand how he's going to attack us. And if we understand how he's going to attack us, then we can prepare for that kind of attack and we can be ready to defeat him when he attacks us in those ways. Now, much of the success of our enemy, I think, can be attributed to two major assets. Number one, according to the Gallup Research Group, 59% um, of all people who call themselves Christians do not believe, and I know, I know you had to, you, you, some of you guys have Googled this, something, right? Hadn't, you, you said, I don't believe pastor's right about that. I think he's telling me something. No, 59, the Barner Research Group, 59% of the people that describe themselves as Christians do not believe that there is a real devil, that there is a literal devil. They do believe in evil and so forth, but, and that Satan is just a symbol, the, the, the devil and Satan and, and everything the scripture pre prescribes as, a, as an entity is really just a picture, an analogy of evil in this world. And so obviously we have a big problem. And what is the big problem? The big problem is if you don't even believe we have a real enemy, then you're not going to be try, you're not going to prepare to fight him. You know, you're not going to be ready to defeat him. The second asset that he has is uh, what I call stealth. Yeah, I mean camouflage. Uh, he's uh, he's hard to he's hard to see. You know, he he slithers in and he tells a lie and leaves that lie and then he slithers out. And if, and if you're not aware that that's his strategy and you're not discerning about where the different things come from in your life and, and so forth, you're, you're not going to be able to recognize him. That's why the series, Unmasking the Enemy, so that we can see him even in his stealthy kind of ways. Because he's Diablos, right? The devil. He's the accuser and the slanderer of the brothers, and he tries to destroy every um, righteous, every favorable relationship that we have in life with his slander and with his accusations. We've also talked about Lucifer. Lucifer's problem was pride, and how do you defeat pride in your life? You defeat pride with worship, which is the ultimate act of humility as you humble yourself in the presence of God and exalt his greatness and then we looked at, looked at Satan and we found out that Satan is our adversary. He opposes the word of God and he is our adversary in life. And how do you defeat Satan? 
Well, you use the word of God. Remember, he is, uh, the scripture says that he is a liar and that he is the father of lies and that there is no truth in him whatsoever. So anything that you hear from him is never going to be the truth. And the way you defeat the, the lie of the enemy is with the truth of the word of God. Now, today we're unmasking the Antichrist. And there's one word that I would like for you to remember when you leave here today, and that is the word deception. Because the Antichrist is a deceiver. He's marvelous at deception. And, and Pastor Tanya was mentioning this, or somebody mentioned it to me maybe earlier this week when I was talking about the Antichrist in some way. And they said, well, you know, when is the Antichrist going to become the Antichrist? I mean, is the person who is the Antichrist, is he born that way and he just grows up and, and he's the Antichrist? Or does he actually, like Judas, look like a real person and, and, and then Satan enters into him, you know, like it, the Bible says happened to Judas. Uh, no, the, the, the Antichrist is the devil. The Antichrist is Satan. Just as Jesus was God on this earth from the moment he was born, Jesus was born on this earth as the God, uh, as if he was all God and no man and as if he was all man and no God. He was the God man. Now, he started his public ministry at 30 years old. In other words, Jesus didn't go around doing miracles and teaching things and so forth until he was 30 years old, and then he was manifested as the Son of God. But he had been the Son of God all along. Well, the Antichrist is Satan all along. He's, he is the Antichrist. <laughs> Everything that God does, Satan tries to imitate. I don't know if you guys know that or not. And in the tribulation period that we'll be talking a good bit about today, there are gonna be manifestations of the Trinity. You know, the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. We have a triune God. Well, we also have a satanic Trinity. We have the dragon, we have the Antichrist, which is also called the beast, and then we have the false prophet, which is the anti-Holy Spirit. Spirit. So all they're doing is trying to imitate everything that God does except in an evil way. So the Antichrist, I believe personally, this is just my personal belief, and if, if it's 100 years from now and we're all up in heaven, don't remind me that I mentioned this down here. But I do believe that the Antichrist is alive today. Uh, I actually think he's an adult. And uh, I know some of you would be saying, well, you know, uh, who is he? Well, I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, but uh, I don't really know who he is, and thank God. I, I got a few guesses. Uh, I'll keep those to myself, um, who that might be. <laughs> That'd just be a guess. Uh, I have at times, just you know, for you football fans, I, I have at times thought that Tom Brady was probably the Antichrist. Um, <laughs> Seeing how they beat most of the teams I was always pulling for in the Super Bowl, Tom Brady, and Bill Belichick had to be the false prophet. I thought, yeah, that fits just perfectly, you know. But, but that's, just, uh, you know, that's just my own supposition about that. But, but anyway, I do believe that he's alive. I do believe that he is on the stage today, that he's not been revealed, obviously, and I'll show you why that hasn't happened. But the word Antichrist uh, is, is only used four times in the Bible. Um, it's used by John. The, the, the apostle John, John that laid his head on the, on, the, on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, John that wrote the Gospel of John. The name is used four times in the Gospel or in the letter of First John, which only has, by the way, five chapters. And so John is the only one that, that uses the actual name Antichrist, but throughout the Scripture, uh, the Antichrist is described in the book of Revelation. He's called many things, and we'll look at some of those things, but, but he has lots of names, but he's actually called the Antichrist uh, in the Gospel of, or in the letter of 1 John four different times. The, the prefix anti, this is an interesting thing. The prefix anti in the Greek language has two uh, conveyances. Number one, it conveys uh, something that is against, like you would think, like, you know, anti-gravity would be against gravity in the English language. Well, in the Greek language, it also has another connotation, and that means to replace. In other words, to be in place of something else, not only to oppose it, but to be in place of it. So this is what the Antichrist does in, in, in the world today. He not only wants to oppose, come against Jesus Christ in our life, 
He also wants to replace Jesus Christ in our life, and that's really his mission. And he has a twofold strategy for trying to accomplish the mission of opposing and replacing Jesus Christ in the life of humanity. The first strategy that he uses is an outpouring of spiritual deception to incite the world to rebel against God an outpouring of spiritual deception for the purpose of causing the world to riot against God, to rebel against God. Now, this is what's happening today. This is what we're seeing all over the world right now. It's, a, it's, it's called in the Bible an apostasy. The word apostasy means a falling away. So what's happening now is Satan is, has introduced, has poured out on this earth such deception. People are deceived. And it's causing them to fall away from the, the truth of God. And so as this deception is poured out on the earth, we see things happening that we've never seen before on this earth. And the purpose is to create an environment in which this world can be encouraged to rebel against God and against everything that God is about. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. It's a young church, it had just, he, he had just basically established it, and as he goes away, he writes letters back to these churches. And much of our New Testament, much of our New Testament are simply letters that the Apostle Paul sends back to churches that he started. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Corinthians, Romans. All, all of those are just letters to those churches that have become books of the Bible because they're filled with spiritual instruction and word of God. Well, 1 Thessalonians, he wrote back to the Thessalonians and in every chapter, there are five chapters in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and in every chapter, Paul talks something about the return of Christ to this earth for his people. Well, sadly and unfortunately, when the Thessalonians received the letter, a bad rumor began to spread that what Paul had written them was telling them that Jesus has already come and that they've been left behind and that they're actually... Um, in the tribulation period, and that tribulation had actually started on this earth. Now, let me ask you, would that upset you? Yeah, it, 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 if, you're, if your apostle wrote a letter and said, <laughs> said, hey, I'm sorry, you guys have missed it. Jesus has already come, and then you're, I'm sorry, you're left in the tribulation period. Get ready, you know. You better, better hang on real good because it's going to be a rough time for you. Well, sure, that would upset you. Yeah, well, it upset them really bad also. So the book of 2 Thessalonians, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote about three or four weeks later. I mean, think about this. Gigantic turnaround. I mean, my goodness. Uh, this is the word of God, but within three or four weeks, the Apostle Paul had written them a second letter called, obviously, 2 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians, he had two purposes. Number one, to assure them that Jesus had not already come back and to comfort them and, and, and tell them that they had not actually been left behind in tribulation. So in the book of 2 Thessalonians, Paul gives the sequence of events that are going to happen on this earth before the church is taken off of this earth and the tribulation period actually begins. So it becomes a very resourceful book in telling us what to look for as we're standing here waiting for the return of Jesus and we're looking at the world get darker and darker and deception get more and more heavy. When is it gonna be? Well, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter two. We're gonna read about 12 verses here real quickly. Now, brethren, begin at verse one. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's our uptaking and, and going where he is, he says, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away, which is the apostasy, falling away from truth. So that day's not gonna come until first of all, we have this gigantic falling away from truth comes first. And the man of sin, 
Now there's one of the titles for the Antichrist. Like I told you, he's, been born, he's born this way. He's not somebody that just inherits a, a, a spirit. Uh, he is the man of sin. He is, that is, his, that is who he is. And then, and, until, and then the man of sin is revealed. Here comes another one of his names, the son of perdition who opposes. There's one of the, one of the meanings of anti. So he's going to oppose um, and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So there's the second, he's replacing God. So he comes and what he's doing is he's gonna oppose God and he's gonna, at one of these days, he's going to go into the temple of God and he's gonna sit himself on the throne in the temple of God and say, all right, I'm God, worship me. So he not only seeks to oppose God, he seeks to replace God in the lives of humanity. Now, when is that gonna happen? Well, it's called the abomination of desolation and not to throw just a, a vocabulary kink into your armor. The, uh, the, the abomination of desolation just means means it's the worst evil, wicked thing that you could do. And what's going to happen during the tribulation, the Jews are going to rebuild Solomon's temple on the site of Solomon's temple. Right now, uh, the mosque of Omar, uh, a Muslim mosque sits there. The Antichrist is going to take that away from the Muslims. Imagine what that's going to cause. Then he's going to give it to the Jews to prove that he's their friend and he loves them and to deceive them. And they're going to rebuild Solomon's temple. And then on the day they dedicate it, which is halfway through the tribulation period, just hang with me, um, they're going to have a big dedication ceremony and the Antichrist is going to come in the back door with a pig and he's going to come down to the altar and he's going to sacrifice that pig on the altar and the Jews are going to start running for their life because that's the sign. Uh, he's betrayed us. He's tricked us. He's deceived us. We thought he was our friend. And now, and they have to run for the, for the last half, last three and a half years of tribulation, run for their life, baby. Because he's after them. Worse than Hitler, worse than anybody. I mean, they're just hunted down on the Judean hills. He is just um, horrible. But anyway, so, so that's what Thessalonians, that's what the Apostle Paul is telling them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So what we're seeing today is, 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 a, is a moral free fall. Not, not only in America, but, but over the entire world. The last 20 years, I think any of you that have been alive very long, <laughs> you know and you've seen that over the last 20 years, man, things have just accelerated drastically in, in these assaults against truth and, and in total rebellion against the morality of God. I mean, this world is preparing for the rapture of the church because the Holy Spirit is manifested through the church and, 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 and the Holy Spirit is on this earth until he's taken out of the way. And so we're, we're, we're doing everything we, we can to slow down the, the, the morality drift. We're doing everything we can to stop all of that evil from happening, but... Over the last 20 years, it seems like things, regardless of how much effort we make, are just tremendously going down, down, down. But he's not going to totally be revealed. In other words, the world is not going to know who he is. You and I who belong to Christ on this side of eternity, we're not going to get to know who he is because he's not going to be revealed until until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way and the Holy Spirit and the church are together and we are restraining in whatever way possible we can to make a difference to keep that, 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 that evil nature off this earth. And I'm glad that we won't be able to see it because I'm gonna tell you, when, when this world sees the Antichrist, this world is gonna see the worst time of trouble that it has ever seen. It's a time of destruction and, and just terrible and... and uh, and it's going to be horrible and it's going to be a bad time to be alive. So I'm glad the Lord has just per prohibited that. You know, we've lost almost every battle um, in, the last, in the last 50 years for morality. Uh, think about it. Starting back in like in the 1960s, you remember they took prayer out of schools. They took uh, Bible reading out of schools. They, then they took the Ten Commandments out of school. Then along came, uh, what, uh, abortion. And then they started telling us about male and female gender roles that you could choose and be a male if you wanted to or a female if you wanted to. And then they took away the definition of marriage as between one man and one woman like God ordained it. And now they're telling us you don't have to either be a man or a woman, you could be an ex. Have any of you ever seen a birth certificate with an ex on it instead of a male or female? 
Do you know in the state of California, it's legal to have that now, and Oregon, and the state of Washington, and Washington, D.C. Surprise, surprise. But, but you can have that. It's perfectly legal. I mean, premarital sex, uh, is it? I mean, I know many of us in here are parents and our grandparents. I mean, have you ever seen uh, generations of people that are so sexually active and that it means nothing to them? I mean, it's like, I mean, anything, anything goes. It's like a first date. Sex. I mean, you know, there used to be some standard of uh, saving yourself in some way, but nowadays it's just, you know, not even, not even looked at as anything being wrong. Extramarital sex, premarital sex. Man, evil deception just poured out everywhere. Partial birth, birth abortion, which is nothing but pure uh, murder and paganism and heathenism. I mean, even heathens wouldn't do that. You let the baby be born and stick a screwdriver in the back of his head and suck his brains out? I mean, come on now. Come on. That's what pre, that, that, and that's what, uh, that's what, uh, uh, what it, pre, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, partial birth. Abortion is all about. That's what it means. Partial birth. You're born partially and then you, you kill. And God's no longer politically correct. And, 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 and the way you can tell that there's a real God, this is one of the evidences you say. A lot of people say, well, how do you know there's a God? How do you know that God is God? And so forth. Well, all I can say is he's the only one that is opposed nowadays. Have you noticed this? Any guru, any guru, Maharaji, uh, quack, prophet, uh, papa, daddy, what, anybody that has a philosophy about anything to, to do with religion is okay nowadays. And you can have any kind of religion you want to have as long as it's not about God and it's not about Christianity. Now, this is true all around the world. And I know one of the things that I have often wondered about this kind of thing is how does all of the world march to the same evil drumbeat? Well, here's the answer, I think, to that. Uh, call it frequency. If we all in this, in this room had on a little receiver up here, and that receiver could turn into a tune into a certain frequency, and we all had our receivers on the same frequency, and that frequency was playing a, 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 a tune with a certain rhythm to it, then all of us, because we have the same frequency playing, could all pat with the same rhythm because we're all hearing the same frequency <laughs> at the same time, except for me, because I'm uh, uh, rhythmically challenged. But we'd be all patting our foot at the same time. Well, what is happening is the world is tuned in to the, to the devil's frequency and when the devil says something, when the lawless one speaks to them, he speaks to all of them at the same time. They all hear the same thing, and they all begin to respond to those things. So our, church, our job as a church is to restrain that as much as possible. But now, but now we know that we're not going to be able to restrain it forever because that's not God's purpose. God has a further plan for this. I said this back in the 1970s when I used to preach uh, the book of Revelation and I preached about end time things and talked about Jesus coming again and all of those things. And I used to say back then, you know, it's just hard to imagine what a world's going to be like in those, in those days. Because back then, you know, in the early 70s and so forth, it was a little rocky and we had had drugs and sex and stuff of the, of the late 60s. But it, that's a Sunday school picnic compared to what's going on now. And, and, you know, you just couldn't imagine. You said, how, man, how, how could that ever happen in this world? Because you just couldn't see things degenerating as fast as they are. But now, we, when we look around, we don't have to ask, ask that question because it's obvious how things and how quickly things can degenerate. And of course, uh, as things get worse and worse, we in the church begin to know, hey, our time is limited because before all of this stuff actually breaks loose, God's got to get us out of here. And I, I know some people don't believe that. Some people say, well, the church is going to have to go through the tribulation. I'm just sorry, but it's just tighten your belt, baby, and hang on. You're going to get abused, but you got to go through that. Some people say they're going to go halfway through the tribulation. You're going to just face half of it. Now, I want to try to show you right now <laughs> that that's not true and that we're not going to go through any of it. So because here's the, here's the, here's the third uh, issue that we're looking at. The rapture of the church is an in, in an instant of time. All right, so we've got the world being deceived, and then we've got the church spreading the gospel and the Holy Spirit holding back in some restraint. The third event is the rapture of the church, and it happens in an instant of time. 
Uh, the Apostle Paul alludes to how it's going to happen in 2 Thessalonians when he says, and he who restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Now that's a pretty broad description of what's gonna actually happen when the church gets taken out of the way. But Jesus had a great deal more to say about it and he said a lot, a lot more detailed thing. Look at Luke 17, verse 26. This is what Jesus had to say about what is gonna, what's gonna happen when he who restrains is taken out of the way, when the Holy Spirit's taken off this earth, the church is taken off this earth, here's what Jesus said it was gonna be like. Beginning at verse 26, Luke 17. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. You remember Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back. That's a whole nother story. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that in that night, there will be two people in, bed, in one bed, and one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill together, the one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field and one will be taken and the other left. So Jesus says, just like it was in the days of Noah and just like it was in the days of Lot. Now, what was true about the days of Noah and the days of Lot? What was true is that you had righteous people living in a violent an immoral world. So righteous people living in a violent and immoral world before some catastrophic event happened by the hand of God. Now let me just ask you this. Are we living in a violent and immoral world today? So just like in the day that we are living today in this in this pre-judgment world, before, before Christ comes and tribulation happens, in this pre-judgment world, business is going on as usual, right? We're marrying, we're giving in marriage, we're selling things, we're buying things, we're going to work, we're having a life, we're taking vacations. I mean, business, in this violent and immoral world, business is going on just like business always goes on, all right? Well, the last period of judgment on this earth is a period of seven years and it's called the tribulation. And it's going to be the last seven years of human history. Now it's not the last seven years of everything that will happen on earth, but it is the last, hum last seven years of human history. And what I'm saying to you is I'm saying that we will not be here during those seven years terrible years. There are going to be people that are going to be on the earth. There are going to be people that are left behind. But I believe that all believers are going to be taken from this earth before these seven years of horror begin on the earth. And I, I want to just bring a few thoughts and, and just tell you why I believe this. If you, be, if you read the book of Revelation the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zechariah, and a few other assorted passages here and there. The total number of people killed in the tribulation period is going to amount of a population more than half of the people that are on earth. Right now, there are 7.5, almost 7.6 billion people on this earth right now. Let's just say 
a billion of those people go, with the, go in the rapture. That'd be a big number. Uh, I don't know if there are a billion believers on this earth right now, but out of 7.5, 7.6 billion people on the earth, let's just say a billion of them go to heaven with Jesus. So now we're down to 6.5 billion people that are left on this earth. Well, according to all of those passages that talk about all the terrible things that happen on this earth during those seven horrible years of tribulation, Meteors hit the earth, stars hit the earth, water turns to blood, plagues hit the earth, pestilences, famine, one third of the sea turns to blood, a good portion of the grass and all the green vegetation on the earth is burned up, and I mean stuff like that. Over half of the people left on the earth are going to be killed. So I'm saying if you read the Bible, you could never believe that God is going to leave his children on this earth during this horrible period of time that is meant to punish the evil that this world has always been. I, I would say to me, it's, it's just utter nonsense. Let me, let me read you a couple of passages. First Thessalonians chapter one. Look at verse nine and 10. This is the apostle Paul writing. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God and from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the Apostle Paul didn't believe we were going to be here. The Apostle Paul said he's going to deliver us from the wrath that's going to come. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Now, I don't know about you, but it would not comfort me, nor would it edify me, lift me up, for somebody to tell me that I was gonna be going through the wrath that is to come. But I would surely be comforted, and I'd surely be edified when somebody tells me, look, you're not going to do that. You're, you're not going through all of that period. God's gonna deliver you before that happens. In Luke 21, Jesus is describing the events that are gonna happen right before he comes to take his church home. And he's also telling the Jews who are going to be left behind, make no mistake about it, guys, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart and life, you are not going in the rapture. Now, there are some Jewish people that have received the Lord. They're called completed or messianic Jews. And they have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior, just like you have and I have. Great, that's what it takes. But anybody who does not receive, what, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, when, and then to make sure you knew what he's talking about, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, either Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, or he lied to us, or that's true. So anybody that doesn't have Christ is not going. So everybody else is gonna be left behind. So Jesus in Luke 21 is telling Gentile people, Christian people that can receive him as their savior, what they need to do, and Jewish people who are going to be in the tribulation, what they need to pray so they don't go in the tribulation. Look what he says in, uh, in verse, let's see, what is it? Verse uh, 36. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, watch therefore. Like we're trying, like I'm trying to teach you to do right now. Watch, pay attention. Look, discern, know what you're seeing. Watch therefore and pray always. Pray for what, Jesus? That you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So he's telling us, look, what you need to do is you need to watch, pay attention, 
Look at the signs. Look at what I'm teaching you. Pay attention to what's going on. Get some discernment in your heart. And you need to pray. And what you need to pray is, Lord, I'm praying that I'm going to be worthy to be taken off of this earth before all these horrible things happen and so that I can stand before you one day. Now, he says that to us, and he says that also to the Jews who, if they don't know Christ, are going to be left behind. But he says, look, you guys need to pray that you would be counted worthy. Now, I'm just saying to you that Jesus would have never told us to pray for something that wasn't possible for us to have. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be horrible of Jesus to say, all right, pray for something, but you're not ever gonna get it, so you know, just keep doing it. No, Jesus would never do that. Now, you may look at me and say, Pastor, you're just an escapist. And I'm gonna say, yes, I am. And because, God, because Jesus told me to pray that way. I pray that way because that's what Jesus said. Now, back to the Second Thessalonians 2. You remember, he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he's taken out of the way and the Antichrist will be revealed. All right, what happens when we're taken and the earth is left? There's no church here anymore. There's no Christians here anymore. There's no Holy Spirit here anymore. What happens? Well, the Antichrist steps onto the scene. And in the book of Revelation, it describes a, a series of catastrophic judgments that begin to happen on this earth when the church and the Holy Spirit are removed and the Antichrist is real. They're given to us in a series of sevens. Seven uh, seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, seven vials of wrath that are poured out on this earth. The sixth seal is described like this. Revelation 6. And the kings of the earth, begin at verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So when they... When they cry out, they say, God, this is such a horrible thing. Let the mountains fall on us. Because that, that one sitting on the throne that we see his face, which tells you they're going to know who it is that's judging them. They're going to know that it's the lamb that's bringing the judgment against them. It's not going to be, oh, what's happening to us? We don't even know what's going on. No, they're looking right at his face and they say, God, you got to get the mountains to fall down on us because, man, that face is killing us from the wrath of the lamb. Now, uh, let me read, for, for the great day of the wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now, isn't that an odd description of wrath, though? Now, think about it. How many of you are afraid of lambs? You're scared of a lamb. I mean, you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you sense that there's a presence behind you and you turn back and it's a lamb and it just terrifies you. No, lambs are not generally terrifying, are they? <laughs> well, what is, a, unless they're a thug lamb, what, what is a, what is so terrifying? <laughs> Y'all, don't get offended. Uh, what's so terrifying about the wrath of a lamb. Well, 2,000 years ago, our precious Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross, uh, a little bigger than that one over there, but that's symbolic of it. And for 2,000 years, he's been offering grace to sinful men. After 2,000 years, he has been spit on He's been slapped in the face. He's been abused. His name has been used as a curse word. And what has he done? He just keeps giving grace and grace and grace and more grace. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's been nothing but, but loving for the past 2,000 years. But on the day that the church is raptured and the people who love him and have committed to him are taken out of this horrible place 
and the Holy Spirit no longer dwells on this earth, that all changes. The Lamb of Grace now becomes the King of Glory. And he begins to pour his wrath over all of this earth. And they're going to know that it's him. They're going to see his face as he sits on the throne. And they're going to seek death, but they're not going to be able to find death. They're going to cry for the mountains to fall down on them and the rocks to fall on them. But they can't even die. Because finally, the justice of God against the sins of this world is finally going to be exercised. And in that day, it's going to be the worst day of human history. And we won't be there. Isn't that good news? I mean, it, it, doesn't that comfort you? <laughs> can, 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 can you get edified by that little bit of information? Sure, yeah. Now, I'm not an alarmist. I mentioned that before. I'm not normally an alarmist, but let me just say this. Um, I imagine that everybody in this room here, and I don't know how many of you guys are, are still hanging with us on the, on, 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 over the air there. But I just want to say to you that if I were you, I would make sure that my heart and my life belongs to the Lamb of Grace. He's the Lamb of Grace right now. He's the sin forgiver. He's the curse breaker. Don't let your pride, Lucifer. Don't, don't, don't let your questioning of the word, uh, Satan. Don't let, your, don't let your slander and your accusation against all the sins of Christians, Diablos. Don't let the deceit and the blindness of the spirit of lawlessness, lawlessness Antichrist, send you into the worst time of trouble and torment and death and hell that this earth has ever, ever seen. Everything in, that the Bible says must happen before the rapture is happening right now at warp speed. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that this great uptaking, which is what the word rapture means, by the way. If you look for the word rapture in the scripture, you're not gonna find it. It's not there. Because it's not, a, it's, not, it's not the word, it, it, it's a description. It means upgathering. The great upgathering. We call it the rapture because that's a word that means upgathering. Because this great upgathering of the church, here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, will happen in the twinkling of an eye. You know how much a twinkle of an eye is? And I'm not gonna dispute this because I actually didn't measure it. I just found some information about it. One forty-fourth of a second. One forty-fourth of a second. That's fast, ain't it, brother? You're not even going to have time to even make a syllable, much less help me or save me. Or, I mean, you're not going to even know what happened. It's going to be so fast. There is this, there's going to be this great division of souls. One will be taken. Jesus said it. One will be taken and one will be left. And let me ask you, what is the reason for that? Why will one be taken and one be left? Is it because one is heavy and one is thin? Is it because one is beautiful and one is not so beautiful? Is it because one is rich and the other one is not so rich? What is it? What is the reason that one will be taken and one will be left? Well, the only basis for the fact that one will be taken and one will be left is that one belongs to Jesus and the other does not belong to Jesus. Jesus knows who belongs to him. Just because you sleep next to somebody that belongs to Jesus doesn't mean you belong to him. Just because you work with somebody who belongs to Jesus doesn't mean you belong to him. Just because you live in the same house and bow your head for the same blessing that somebody does in your house and belongs to him doesn't mean that you belong to him. You have to make a choice to be a Christian. It is a personal choice. God has no grandchildren. You don't get in because your family's in. It can't be assumed or hoped for. It's got to be chosen by faith. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are not a Christian and you are going to be left behind to the worst time of trouble, torment, wrath, judgment that this world has ever seen. And that's not gonna be God's choice. That's your choice. 
He's told you everything he can. He said it with such authority. He's tried to paint pictures of it. He's, he's tried to open it up with his prophets and his preachers and his teachers and his Bibles. He's written us, he's written us 66 books, 31,175 words to tell us how to be ready for him. So I'm not an alarmist, but if I was, that's what I would be telling you. All right. Let me give you another order of event real quick. All right, after, after uh, uh, the church is raptured, the Antichrist is revealed to the world and the world begins to worship him. So in this last seven years of human history called the tribulation, it'll be broken into two periods and I'm not gonna go deep, so don't, don't fade out on me on here, all right? The tribulation is gonna be broken into two periods, three and a half years on each side. In the Bible, it's called 42 months sometimes, it's called time times and a half times sometimes but it's the rise of the Antichrist. And then halfway through, like I mentioned to you, the Jews are gonna rebuild the temple in Jerusalem on the original temple site. The original temple site of Solomon's temple is where the Mosque of Omar sits right now. And I don't wanna, you know, I'm not trying to inform our, our Muslim folks about anything, but I'm just telling you that he's gonna take it away from you. And that's where Solomon's temple is gonna be rebuilt, the one he goes in and puts a pig on the altar and declares war against the nation of Israel. And they have to run for their lives. Uh, and the last three and a half years, they're hunted like animals over the whole last three and a half years of tribulation. Look at Revelation 13, beginning at verse one. This is what the Bible says about it. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and his, and his, and his horns, 10 crowns, and on his head's a blasphemous name. Now the beast, which is another name for the Antichrist, which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, which is Papa Satan, who's, the, who's Daddy Satan, the dragon gave him his power, just like God the Father if you imagine that with Jesus, Jesus pleasing God the Father, he did what the Father said. The beast or the Antichrist is gonna do what the dragon says. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. This is gonna be some big deal and the world's gonna say, my Lord, he's so powerful, let's follow him. And they're gonna follow the beast. Now remember, no Christians here, no Holy Spirit here, no spirit of truth, no, no nothing to, to hinder this kind of stuff. And, and they say, we're gonna follow him. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. All of us that have already gone on, he's cursing us. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints. And I'm just saying this to tell you that there are gonna be some people that come to Christ during the tribulation period. There are going to be some people that come to Jesus. There are gonna be 144,000 Jewish Apostle Pauls preaching the gospel, and they're gonna be winning some people to Jesus. Of course, everybody they win is gonna be martyred, and it won't be any of you. I can just tell you that. You know why I know it won't be any of you? Because right now, you're hearing the truth of God. And if you don't respond to the truth of God on this side of grace, you're not gonna get another opportunity on the other side. You know why? Because God's gonna delude you. He's gonna send a spirit of delusion. Let, let me continue to read. And uh, granted him to make war with the saints and look at the next line, and to overcome them. That means he's gonna kill them. It means God's given him the authority that anybody who believes in Christ is a death sentence. Good, kill them, and, and God will take care of it, and they'll sit under the throne for a little while, but they're gonna come back. But that's a whole different thing. And authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This man who is the most evil man in world history called the beast, the antichrist, Satan incarnate, is about to be revealed and when he does, this is how the world is gonna receive him. And then the last 
event of end time that I'm gonna talk about is the second coming of Christ. And just to, it'll take just a second. I wanna tell you there's a difference between the second coming and the rapture. A lot of times people talk about them as if they're the same. They're not the same. The rapture of the church happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And no one knows it's happened except the people that it happens to. The world obviously will be able to look around after the rapture and see the results of the rapture, like, what happened to Granny? Or my preacher, what? you know, we used to go to church. There'll be people come to church. They'll say, man, the church isn't no one. I mean, they'll be able to see the results of the rapture, but they won't tie together the fact that this missing of Christians is this thing about Jesus coming and getting them and we're gonna be in a world of trouble here in a minute. They're not gonna do that because God's gonna send strong delusion and they're not gonna be able to, to understand what's going on. But anyway, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That's when the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. And then look at this little description here. It just tells you what's gonna happen at the second coming of Christ, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So what's going to be his ultimate? What's going to be the ultimate conclusion of the of the beast and Antichrist? It, it, God's going to destroy him at his coming. Well, when is he going to come? Well, he's going to come, and uh, he's going to come at the end, and he's going to destroy the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast at the Battle of Armageddon, and. That'll be the end of, the, of everything. There'll be a new heaven, new earth, millennial kingdom and so forth. And then, then there'll be the final judgments. But that's all after, after the human history is over. So I told you that the Antichrist had two, two, um, two modes of operation, two, um, two, two ways of, of, of uh, dismantling us from being ready for, for the Lord. One is the spirit of deception. And here's the second one to seduce God's people with worldliness to keep them from trusting and serving him. So the, the strategy of Satan in these last days is twofold. Number one, deceive us to the point that we will not trust God. We will not serve God. And we will be, we will be left behind. The second thing is to seduce God's people with worldliness to keep them from trusting and serving God. The only thing Satan doesn't want to happen is for you to complete the purpose for which God created you. And it doesn't matter to him how you miss it. You can miss it laying in the ditch drunk. You can miss it laying in some crack house somewhere. You can miss it on a college campus being smarter than everybody else. You can miss it by sitting at home and working in a business and be more concerned about uh, your family or your business or your money or whatever. It doesn't matter to him how you miss it, just so you miss it. So he sends distractions into the world in order to keep us seduced away from paying attention to the things of God. And I, I wanna show you this passage and then, and then, and then we, we'll pray. Um, this is 1 John 2. This is a strategy. This is the strategy. 1 John 2, verse 15. Here's what, here's what he's doing right now. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Listen to this. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone <laughs> loves the world, mm -hmm. that means the things of the world, mm -hmm. the ways of the world, mm -hmm. the adventures of the world, the strategies of the world, mm -hmm. the way the world operates. If you love that, then John says that the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, everybody say pleasure. The lust of the eyes, say possessions. And the pride of life, say performance. All that is in the world, our pleasures, our possessions, 
our performance. We got to be somebody. We got to be respected. We're big men on campus. We're followed by people full of pride, full of lust for things and lust for pleasure. And our life is ruled by that. That is love of the world. And that is, and, and that is the spirit that Satan has poured out to seduce us, people who know God, people who come to church and, and kneel at an altar and sing worship songs and pray and, and, and say, come on, Jesus. And I mean, instead of, uh, instead of witnessing to our family and living godly lives and being dedicated and devoted and showing them how to live as a man of God and show how to be dedicated and to sacrifice for things of God, we show them how, how much money means in our life and how much the stuff we have means to us. And how long we got to work and, 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 and not be an illustration to our family or our life or anybody else. And we can't go to church. We're too tired because we've been playing all weekend on the boat. You love the world and the love of the Father is not in you. And that is a satanic seduction so that you will not live the purpose that God created you to live. And neither will your family. Because believe it or not, your children watch you. They learn from you. I'll just give you one little tiny example, and I'm not even meaning to embarrass John or, <laughs> or Daniel. But Daniel, I, Daniel does some grass cutting with me now. And uh, he just does it in an unusual way. And nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it at all. It's just different from anybody I've ever seen. And um, so I asked him one day, I said, I said, why do you do that? Why don't you do it another way? And he said, well, I just, I, I like to do this. Do it this way. I said, well, fine, have at it. Because he's the one doing it. And so, I mean, he can do it any way he wants to, as far as I'm concerned. But it is unusual. So I asked John about it this morning, his dad. I asked John. Now, John, now, and I'm not saying anything out of school, but John is genetically, he's not Daniel's genetic father biologically, but he's, he's the only father Daniel's ever had, and he's his father. So it's not a genetic thing, is what I'm telling you. I asked John, I said, why did he do that? And I said, no, I'm not criticizing, I just want to know. He said, well, that's the way I do it. <laughs> See what I'm telling you? They, they watch you. They do what you do. They look at life like you look at life. So they go to college and get so smart they don't need to anymore. But, <laughs> but until then, they're going to do what you do. <laughs> and they're going to do it like you do it because that's the way they think it ought to be done. Now, I'm just trying to tell you, and I'm not, I mean, look, this message is for everybody. I'm not talking to any person particularly, even myself. But the enemy is so deceptive and so seductive, and so camouflaged and stealthy that he will slither in, drop this thing on you, slither out, and you'll never know it was him. And it is a complete distraction so that you will not be what God has called you to be. Nor will anybody that looks at you as their hero are their role model. They will be just like you. So he gets a trifecta, you know? He gets everybody. And I'm just telling you, that's one of his strategies for this last day. Look, look, we gotta defeat this joker now. We, 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 can't, we, we, got, we got to win this thing because we're not gonna be, I, I don't think, we're gonna be here much longer. Now, it might be 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. I, I'm not, I don't know anything. I'm not, I'm not telling you I got a word from God, we're gonna be going tomorrow. But I'm just telling you that I believe any of us that, that have any sense of spirituality in our life are sensing that, buddy, time is tough right now. I mean, I mean, not all over this world. Craziness all over this world. Lunacy. I mean, delusion, delusion. You, you're thinking, how could somebody believe that? It's just delusion. It doesn't even make any sense. It's mental illness. It's ridiculous, and, and it's all caused by this enemy, and this is his strategy. 
And I just wanted you to know how, how he works it. And that's the Antichrist. That's the anti, the one who opposes and wants to replace God in all of our lives. All right, let's bow our heads. 